And it should be recording once the recording button turns red in the upper corner. There we go. Cool. Um, so now we're recording. So welcome everyone to this week's working group, Security and Critical Projects Working Group meeting. Um, I'm sharing the agenda today or the, the meeting notes. So we usually sign in everyone's names um, so we get to know each other. And it's a light agenda. So I guess maybe I'll just do a call for topics right now if anyone has something they want to add or discuss. I can have, I can have. I'm looking forward to hearing from Case, but I'm like, uh, I, have a, I have a drop early. So uh, I may. Uh... Okay. Um, Josh, do you mind if we switch the order? Well, well, well actually, to... you can you can keep the order. Maybe if okay. it's a, a, yeah, don't don't make me the. <laughs> All right, thanks, David. Um, cool. So, yeah. So Josh added something here about um, talking about the package feeds project, and I know we have a few people on the call that um, have some context to that project. So Josh, do you want to talk about your proposal? And you can take over the screen too if if you want to present something. Sure. Um, yeah, so I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Package Feeds project. Um, it's something that um, my colleague Tom and I have got involved with recently. Um, and we put this document together to kind of highlight some of the changes that we'd like to see in the project um, and, you know, how that might fit into stuff that might be useful to everyone else. Um, and we've kind of uh, push, pushed that through last week with some discussions with Dan um, and Jordan uh, ended up um pushing forward to that getting done um we've actually implemented most of this now but i will quickly just try and share my screen do you want, do you want me to share this or do you want to um... yeah yeah it, it's it's fine yeah if you've already got the sharing going um it, it's just a brief document with um kind of our initial understanding coming into the project um at the top which may be useful um for anyone who's not familiar with the project and how it works um and that's how it is uh currently and then at the bottom we've got some um listed features that we would like to see and have have spent the last week or so working on um trying to add so so um one of the main things that we we have here is um we we it ingests package updates from several package repositories um so that those can be fed into other services. Uh, currently, package analysis is an example repository of that um, that is consuming them. Uh, but in theory, it could be anything. Um, and the problem we one of the problems we face is the fact that these feeds, uh, PyPy, RubyGems, uh, Nougat, etc., um, they are some of them are lossy. So um, to highlight that as an issue, you know, if we if we're ingesting those um, for a service which is critical to our systems and we can't afford to have a, a missed update, say uh, PyPy, for example, takes the last 50 updates. Um, and if you've not pulled fast enough or uh, say 51 packages have been released in the past five minutes, there's no way you're going um, to be able to pull fast enough to catch everything. It's always going to have the potential to be lossy. Um, so one of the things that we're looking to do there is to, one, um, minimize that in the case where um, we have identif identified implementations that have that issue by, um, say, for PyPy, if we have specific packages that are um, of issue to us and we want to monitor those, we can monitor those specifically rather than just checking the firehose of every update in PyPy. And that can help to minimize um, loss on a subset of packages. Obviously, that's not feasible for the entire, um, rep uh, entire repository. Um, but given the current availability of PyPy APIs, that's the best we've got. Um, I believe there's some work in progress to kind of improve that, maybe on several fronts, but um, it's not really feasible right now. Um, so we have that, but we, all, we also have some efforts towards um, kind of just identifying that. You know, we're, we're, we're trying to improve the logging for that so that when this does happen, if we've identified there's, you know, the, the possibility that data has been lost, then we can at least log that and try and monitor, um, you know, which feeds this is an issue for, whether it's PyPy, NPM, 
um, and then look to improve that in the future and maybe um, push upstream uh, repository maintainers to kind of have APIs available, like say um, PHP Packagist actually allows you to query all of the package updates since a certain time, which means you don't really have these issues because you tell it when you want information from and it gives you it. And then we have some other minor changes, that being the main one, which is Kafka. You know, GCP is the current implementation. Um, I, I imagine there are several people who have uh, Kafka running in their, in their systems, and, and we're one of those people. So um, we'd like to consume this via um, publishing to Kafka and then reading from Kafka with uh, a consumer. And also a means of scheduling internally. Currently, the application is pulled by a curl request, which happens on a timer in, G uh, in Google Cloud, I believe. Obviously, um, we'd like to kind of encapsulate that into the, the Docker image so that there's um, no dependency on a third party service to ask for the data to be ingested, but it can instead just be done on a schedule. But like I said, we, we've 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 worked towards adding some of these. You know, any any feedback or review is is great. If anything here is uh, relevant to anyone, then we'd be interested in hearing how we can adapt some of these ideas to um, make this work best for everyone. Well, we got one question. Yeah. Sorry, I also was hovering muted. Um, so yeah, I've, I've contrib contributed to this project in the past, um, in particular the composer um, part of it or packages part of it. Um, I'm just wondering um, how you would like feedback to this. Um, like, should we just add comments to the Google Doc, or do you want to have um, it in uh, GitHub issues or something? Yeah, I think I think either here in open discussion or in the document is fine. Um, I think for some of the larger topics like lossiness, we we do have issues open for those that can be added to. Um, and if I think if there are any other ideas, then I mean Tom and I are around to kind of hear these ideas and see how we can push the project forward with that. Josh, maybe you can link some of the issues in this in this doc. Yeah, I'll take a look. Mm -hmm. Cool. Any other questions for Josh? Um, just to jump in on Tom, uh, there were engineers being uh, contributing some stuff. So we have been looking at uh, just providing general updates to the code base. Uh, so like uh, expanding the unit tests. Um, one thing that we were interested in is knowing that the data that we were getting fed from the publishers we could have a reference to what we would be being fed so we've pushed through some work to provide a json schema of uh, the data that's being dumped on the wire so obviously that's currently the implementations of the kafka publisher or the gcp publisher uh, but that could be expanded so there's a sem semantically version schema now that's included and tested again so if we ever update the ingester to add extra metadata, downstream subscribers should be able to know there's a change and what that changing entails. Um, so yeah, um, linting is obviously a thing. We want consistency. So we've I've pushed some linting changes today to try and get the code base in a consistent state. Um, so that's up if, <laughs> if anybody really wants to review some lint changes. Um, yeah, that's just what I wanted to add. Yeah. Cool. All right. Um, back to the agenda here. So that's linked in the in the meeting notes, and also the um, a, a link to the GitHub project too. I added. Uh, Case, do you Hello. want to go next? And then maybe sure. yourself. Um, hi, uh, my name is Case Cook. Um, I just thought I'd pop into the Securing Critical Projects bit here with something that came up and, and actually Laurent reminded me of uh, a little while ago, but I think it comes back to sort of a 
a global issue, um, which is uh, compiler flags. Uh, there is a lot of hardening features enabled in, uh, that can be enabled by compilers, um, and that affects basically everything you're building, of course. Um, the link is mostly an example uh, of this, but um, the, the issue of hardening the stuff that you've built is certainly not new, uh, but traditionally these flags are enabled sort of uh, in package management and not sort of globally for the compiler. So the package, if you built a package through a distro's package management system, you'll get the flags, but if you just build it yourself, in some container outside of package management, you may not get those flags. Um, and I think that that's uh, a, a problem since we're, we're ex needlessly exposing, uh, uh, you know, hand-built, hand-rolled stuff to, to attacks because those features are off by default. Uh, they're only turned on uh, if you're inside a package manager. Um, uh, when, when I was running the security team at Ubuntu, I basically demanded from the compiler team that those be on by default. So if you're building your college program or if you're you know, rebuilding Apache or Nginx or something on your own outside of um, the package management, you would still have the benefit of all of those security features. Um, it looks like um, Ubuntu and, and to a certain extent Alpine um, are the only distros that are doing this. Uh, and I think that this is a, a, an unusual sort of a, a, a gap in the defenses um, that we have globally. Um, and it's, you know, not, a, this isn't about any specific issue. Uh, it's just that I think that there is an obvious uh, gap in, in defending the, all of the other critical pieces that someone might depend on uh, inside their, for their workload. But that was that was it. Uh, I see a hand up from from David. Uh, yes, yes, indeed. Um, so uh, first, I, I think you are in a case. I, I'm a big yeah. fan of of the hardening work. Thank you again yeah. for <laughs> for what you've been doing. Yeah. Um, I think we've talked about this before, but I think it might be useful to talk about it again. I agree with you that the defaults should be all these hardening measures, mm -hmm. but I don't think the defaults should even be within the packages. I think the defaults should be within the compilers themselves. Oh, yes, sorry, I, I, so, I thought it wasn't clear. It should be in the compiler, and that's what Ubuntu and Alpine have right. done. No, 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 no. You're talking yeah. about the distribution of the compiler. I'm talking about the from the GCC the the and CLang developers that should be the default if you I really really that. want an insecure build you can ask for it but i don't know many people who think you know today i want to generate an insecure build so well yeah it, it's... i think from the critical projects point of view can we press that <laughs> that's a yeah i mean I completely agree. I would rather have it on in the upstream compilers themselves than in each distribution of it. Um, right. I think the uh, faced with the developer communities in GCC and in Clang, uh, I have taken the more practical approach of saying that there is almost no hope of making that change in the upstream compilers. Um, they're very, very, very conservative about the kinds of changes they make there. Um, the middle ground that I that got worked on a little bit by some Gen 2 developers was basically adding configure options to easily turn this on and off in compilers. Um, and that that's probably as far as we can push it right now. Um, it's sort of all about changing what you know what everyone's used to. And you know I Ubuntu made their compiler changes you know, over 10 years ago, and I'm, I'm still waving my arms on this one. Um, so it would be nice, but I don't think we would ever be able to convince upstream compilers to make this change without also turning around and saying, hey, look, this is literally how every distribution ships your compiler. Why are you doing insecure defaults when literally everyone else on the planet who uses your software uses it in a safe fashion? Um, so we might have to sort of push Scale. that slowly. Yeah. I, 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 the power of public opinion and also like forcing upon them a CVE, you know, could, could potentially provide some 
like, you know, uh, social pressure in that direction, maybe. I'd, I'd like to think so, but I mean, there's, I, my, my current counterexample, um, again, and this is mostly just uh, pragmatism, I think, as far as scaling what we can get done and what we can accomplish uh, quickly. Um, the the counterexample I have and, and the sort of strong conservatism I see from GCC and Clang, uh, while they are perfectly well-meaning, they're mostly defending their, um, you know, like the, the C definition, the C++ definition. And one, you know, one CVE won't do it. In fact, an entire class of vulnerabilities won't even do it either. Um, like uninitialized stack variables has been like a ever running flaw forever. Um, and Clang and very soon GCC will have a flag basically to eliminate that. And even Clang will not take that as like, they don't even want to have that be an option in the compiler. And it took a lot of pressure to even make that happen uh, because the view of some of the contributors is that it forks the C language into you know, undefined versus defined behaviors and Oh, there's a lot I mean, of politics involved. <laughs> yeah, but I'm, pushing, I'm talking about actually like making, uh, creating, a, not against like, you know, downstream CV because of, a, I'm talking about like, you know, pushing the CV on the compiler and saying, hey, this is a, the, the compiler itself is vulnerable because of this. Yeah, okay. That, that is possible. I think that there's, uh, yeah, I, 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 I end up with some negative outcomes from that. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm actually rather skeptical. The, uh, the the CV folks, will, I think, will correctly point out that that is behavior as defined, yeah. and and really, I I don't think it'll have any useful effect. Um, I like Keith, Case's idea of maybe getting the distros to basically buy mm -hmm. in, and maybe that would be the way to buy to have these other groups buy in. Yeah. And as, and as far as like scoping actual work to be done here, I think one of the main pushbacks that I, that I saw, again, this was some time ago, um, was the fact that the features weren't considered sort of uh, expected by the actual compiler itself. So when the compiler <laughs> would run its own self-tests, um, if you built the compiler with these things turned on, the self-tests would fail because they were expecting slightly different layouts or slightly like there was a lot of corner cases that would get broken. So to get um, package like compiler package maintainers to accept these kinds of changes in a distro probably requires upstream work to to add these kinds of um, you know uh, configure flags or whatever that make it a first class citizen within the upstream compiler without making it a default, but just making it possible to build um, with those flags enabled by default. Um, so I think that's where the where there's sort of a unit of work we could apply to solving this. And then we turn to the distros and say, you see, it's really easy. You just add a configure flag and everything still works. Um, for example, I believe that would convince Debian because that was their specific um, issue with it. Um, um, yeah, I, 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 it's okay. I was just going to say, um, thank you for pushing this, uh, one. And two, I know there is, it's a small number of developers, but I know there are developers, at least in my company, that use C for like some of this stuff that's super performance critical. There's like firmware stuff or there's something squirreled away in some teeny tiny little piece of silicon someplace right and so i often have to do a lot of you know conversation with these folks to say no 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 let's let's be right so it's yeah undefined behavior is is should should not be the the default but um that's kind of a war that i i i get to fight but right. the and probably anybody doing like hardware of one sort or another has to deal with that but i love the idea of saying look students or whatever who are doing their first project shouldn't start with this you know behavior that's insecure secure by default has always been the sort of you know kind of mantra we've had around here everywhere when we talk about stuff that's going on and you know either any any sort of software we're working on in my company at least so um i think driving that back um is a great idea case in court according to you which of the distros we should target because i think collectively we probably have enough uh, opportunity to influence uh, this sort of um, thing well, I think I think step two is going to the distros. I think step one is uh, making these options first class citizens within the the builds and test case like 
the, the test frameworks, the self-test frameworks that the compilers have. Um, without that, it creates a lot more work for distros uh, and it's a harder sell. Um, so if these options can be made, you know, if you can build the compiler and have it pass all of its self-tests uh, in, in, in that way, then suddenly it's really easy for distros to turn this on. Um, with regard to sort of the different use cases of compilers and, you know, stuff, very tiny or embedded stuff where some of these features make no sense, um, usually you end up with separate compiler packages. Like I think there's, you know, the, the GCC for AVR, for example, it doesn't, you know, is it going to turn on stack protector or whatever else? Um, so I think on a, but for, for non-specialized stuff, it seems like uh, by default would be nice. If, if I can jump in, first of all, I, mm -hmm. I did some embedded in the past and, you know, I remember needing an eye bleeding number of options uh, mm -hmm. when you actually care about, uh, you know, how many bytes something takes. So mm -hmm. <laughs> it seems to me that having to turn off something, you know, having to add extra flags for an embedded process. Oh, look, the world is just the same as it was five minutes ago. I don't right. see what the big deal is. <laughs> <laughs> the, the complexity, yeah, the complexity with that one tends to be that um, you end up with a different runtime. So you know, you may not in the embedded world, you may not have a libc at all. And um, sure. some of the features like Fortify and to some extent Stack Protector end up depending on your runtime as well. So you, you know, sort of have to lean on that in some cases. But anyway, that's it's right. those I mean, are I feel those as corner cases. Yeah, I mean they're 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 significant users, but mm -hmm. typically again these folks already have to turn on a lot of flags to get things to work in a, oh, look, you have no runtime, you have no OS. Well, exactly. you know, guess what? You're going to need some flags anyway. Right. And um, having it be first class in the compiler build itself means that it's trivial to define, like, oh, this this compiler we've deemed, you know, safe by default. This one we've deemed, you know, specifically for having as few features as possible because you're so close to the bare metal or whatever. Um, like it, it makes it easy to make those changes. Right. Um, I mean, if we can make it easier to turn on and off sets of flags, I mean, there's already flags for sets of flags anyway, but mm -hmm. um, I think there's a step zero, which is sort of a list of what, you know, what would you like to see? You know, see? I mean, I, I know there's a whole bunch mm -hmm. of lists of recommended flags anyway. Yeah. Um, I bet you could probably point us to some some list. Yeah, if, the, we could, if we could have a here's what to do and kind of a marching direction, maybe mm -hmm. we can make this happen. Yeah, that, uh, the the link I gave was the example um, wiki that uh, that Ubuntu publishes about what their default flags are. Um, some of those are about um, optimizing their how the linker behaves and some other things, but the bulk of it is are, are the security features that are enabled by default. Um, Okay. So that's, uh, that's, that's, I would say that's the list. <laughs> okay. Well, we, we might want to say it's this list minus these because yeah, if, yeah. not, if they have nothing to do with security, I, I, I'm not sure we want to push those, yeah. unless there's other good reasons for them anyway for everybody. Yeah. yeah I think there's only one that, um, yeah, there's, uh, I think the, the last two in the flags past the linker uh, on, on the Ubuntu wiki are probably not security relevant, but, um, but if easier. they're not bad anyway, I'm gonna I'm not gonna fight you on yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, I, I I don't have much opinion about them. I know that there are very good reasons to do it. Um, it's just that those those reasons came out of a different universe than where where I was looking. Hey, by the way, the other uh, comment I would make. By the way, I, I, you're right with step zero and step one and step two. Okay. Um, uh, the other player out of this, have you, have you, there's a chap named Ryan Ware. Have you talked to them at all, uh, Case? You know who I'm talking about. He, there's another. Open SSF work group that's working on security yeah. tools, and I think okay. he just picked up the the chairmanship of that uh, that working group. So mm -hmm. I think um, he's usually the one I lean on 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 flags and and that sort of thing. Okay. So it may be good to kind of get more. I, I don't want. I think we're responsible. I feel responsible for this, right, as a work group. But I think get getting more work groups on board on this is a is a good thing. You're smiling, yeah. David. I I'm wondering if that's a because you agree with me or do you disagree? I, I think it's good to talk to the, to the tools group. The other working group that might be relevant would be the best practices working group. But but yeah. it seems to me this is not just a, hey, do good practices. The real yeah. goal is make it so if you do nothing, you quietly do the right thing. 
Exactly. Right. <laughs> exactly. And, and that's and that's like I didn't have a specific agenda. It was more like I want to raise the awareness and just get what people see what people think of this because I think it's important. Right. Now, Case, how far do you think we can get? I mean, we can do one thing where I know the package managers all support like default flags when you create a package. Yeah. Um, can we make it so that when things are compiled on the typical distro, it's automatically with these without I, I've never looked into yeah, that question. That, that's exactly what I mean. Like with these flags okay. on by the uh, by the compiler, then everything you build there gets it. No, no, no. I mean, I mean, yeah. if I typed in GCC file name. Yeah. Uh, is there I haven't checked I haven't checked into this. I've, I've used these tools lots, but is, is there a way to set like global standard flags? Um, it depends on how you built the compiler. Um, in some in some cases, yes, you you can uh, specify an external spec file, but traditionally, um, well, at least where I've seen it, uh, that's not so easy. Um, which is why I wanted it on by default in the compiler. You just run GCC and those right. flags are turned on. Right, yeah. and, and I think that's that's basically what we want. We want to move as close as we can yeah. towards. Yeah, and it, it depended like the way Debian and Ubuntu built their GCC. It didn't look like you could specify external spec files, but I know that that's one of the main ways that Gen2 back then uh, turned on these types of flags is through their common, like they didn't change the code, they changed the spec file uh, that the compiler loaded by default. So I think there's a bunch of different ways to approach the implementation, um, but ultimately it looks like making it a first class citizen within the compiler build itself is probably the right, the right step. Um, and I know, for example, GCC um, gained, you know, should I enable Pi by default as a configure flag um, somewhere along along the way there. So that all got sorted out. Okay. But many others remain. Gotcha. Um, yeah, I, 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 th I think many of us have different uh, connections with different, pa uh, different Linux distros that yeah. probably could move along this. Yeah. I, mean, I, I know the the Alpine folks, and mm -hmm. you you know the Ubuntu folks. Um, I'm sure we can talk well, to Debian and Fedora. If we look at step one of our our proposed three step process, okay, step zero, we got to figure out the flags, right? But who has the who has the uh, you know if you're going to add these things as first class citizens, it's it's like it helps to actually push the code, um, mm -hmm. right? That's right. That's at least you know let's do a pull request on the code that would do that. Um, uh, I have some folks. I can talk to the that work on the GCC and and uh, LLVM projects. I, I'm playing. I could just uh, you know talk with them and 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 um, anybody else have that kind of you know influence to to start that. I mean, I think I think we have enough connections and places we can talk to. I think really it's just a matter of the work to get it done, like collectively to, to collectively to do that. Take the time to do that and fix the the, the test cases because. Right. There's a, really a lot of uh, tiny little pieces that change when you start mucking with these options. Yeah, it's not an insignificant it. amount of work, is what you're saying. Right. Got it. Well, Kate, Case, would you mind picking up? I guess it's sort of step zero, which is basically sure. a short, I don't know, a blog post, something mm -hmm. saying, "Hey, we need to switch over to secure defaults. We should use these flags in these circumstances and link off." Sure. And then um, I think several of us can point to that <laughs> and start at least uh, okay. talking to see what we can do for the next steps. Um, I know that the I, I'm actually inter interacting with uh, Alpine Linux, for example. They're interested in making some improvements. This might be a very easy time to make, you know, you mentioned Alpine's already doing some. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they're doing all of the things that you've noted or not. Um, I think uh, when... Lauren looked at it <clears throat> pretty recently. Uh, I think the the only thing that was missing there was some of the there was runtime support missing in their libc for uh, for Fortify, um, and they. Uh, well, have I a, recall they uh, used Musil, yeah. not yeah. they used Musil. So use there's a Musil challenge. and and Musil specifically does not want a Fortify implementation that's specific to Musil. So there's a bit of a political um, question there. Um, they, they, they didn't like want Fortify. Form. They just didn't want it specific to them, right? Correct. They did not want patches in Musil to support Fortify. They wanted an external implementation of Fortify, which, <laughs> uh, like, it, it's it's not an unreasonable technical request. But from a pragmatic point of view, 
all of the other libc's have implemented fortify like it's it's a, a weird position to be um, but anyway that's an example of the technical and political problem that needs to be addressed to get this done for step i don't know how we've numbered it now but step two which is getting it into the <laughs> yeah. yes thank you <laughs> step IV. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to use fractions, but okay. <laughs> so I, I, you know, I, you know what I'm hearing, case. I'm, I'm hearing, um, at least so far, unanimous agreement, or at least no objections. Yeah, uh, we're all the security-minded folks. We're, we're not the, the language uh, defenders. So <laughs> this is, uh, I this got is easy to convince this room of that. <laughs> Uh, fair enough. Uh, yeah. I'm also but, thinking that if I if you have that blog post, I don't think that Gradle automatically supports throwing a bunch of these arguments in. So I'd totally like you know use that as a draw, like add all those defaults to Gradle too as a hmm. um, as as a you know when when we generate the the compiler calls like those would be the defaults unless you set some manual ones that'd be a really cool addition there. Um, and maybe right. even, you know, throw a CV on there of like, hey, Gradle actually configured your compiler in an insecure way. I really think that it should be driven to the compiler level. Like your your compiler is insecure by default, but I'll let that go. I I I would if, support such such ideas, but that's not bad. I have I've attempted such battles in the past and it's uh I would use my time differently. Let's <laughs> let's 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 take this up. Uh, ping yeah. me on the Slack afterwards, yeah. we'll chat a little bit more. Yeah. Anyway, that, that's all. I just wanted to raise awareness, and apparently now I've uh, prepared a, a list of things for me to do. Oops. Anyway. Get your Teflon working better next time. Yeah, uh, I know. No, I think I think the I agree with the blog post. Is when we get that out there, I think that's going to really help point to that and go, look, let's 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 do the right sort of basic stuff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but but, uh, but uh, although uh, although of course I always view it as a success when I manage to uh, put a to do list on some of buddy else. Uh, <laughs> um, oh no, Dave I, Wheeler, are you sure you're not a manager? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, such sorry. a low blow. Sorry. Um, oh, I thought I had mute on. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So, so but, but in all seriousness, I mean. Case, you've you've been working at this for a while, so I, th I think it's reasonable to ask you to, to make that first. I really, you've no, got absolutely. the information in hand. Yeah, um, it's not a long list. <laughs> yeah, but I, and in fact, I think you should be able to just point off to to things rather than having to generate anything from scratch. Right. Uh, but but I think that I think there's uh, definitely an opportunity here. I I think yeah. more there's I think that some of those battles may there may be less pushback than there was before as yeah, it's, it's stuff been a, keeps it's happening. Been a minute. Oh, David still has funny. hand raised case, so I think he's volunteering to help you out. That's how I. Oh, believe. excellent! Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, if, if he does this, this part, I'll I'll be happy to help out the second part. And in fact, case, mm -hmm. if you can give any arguments for why this isn't so crazy, like mm -hmm. you know, you already mentioned the Alpine does all but one of these. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. it, you know, it, it, any argument you can raise that suggests you know that that some folks are already there uh would be great well a yeah. to try to work with with uh musel and, and and or alpine to try to fix that one spot left but also on the others yeah and i know that fedora turns on a number of flags i don't i haven't done the cross compare with uh what you yeah. what you've had yeah last i checked they turn on the flags in their package build systems so not right. the compiler itself um, not so, the compiler yeah, it's itself. Like, yeah, everybody doing like regular package builds turns these on now, so you know that that's that problem is at least gone. But I I still think, especially given the sort of rise in containers and people building whatever they want on their own, as opposed to depending more heavily on necessarily packaged you know prepackaged distro software, I think this problem has sort of resurfaced. Okay, so I realize this is some, this may be going to the weeds. But what if we tried instead of convincing the compiler makers to make certain flags the default, enable the a global default settings, like you know before, when GCC starts up, mm -hmm. it loads from here the default mm -hmm. things. Then each package, you know, e each distro could modify that, and you'd still get there. Yeah, 
Um, or at least and I get a lot of the way there. Right. And I think that that was sort of how spec files worked. And I don't know the history on why some distros use spec files and some don't. I, so I'm not sure on that piece, but uh, there were okay. strong I, I think feelings gonna... about that. <laughs> Yeah, I think we, we may have to drill down briefly. I, I mean, that, I don't think that should take uh, days of research, but that may be something worth exploring. Basically, finding a way through the uh, through the technical desires of different groups to get where you want to go. Right. Oh, what's... Oh, I don't have chat open. Cool. Anything else on this topic? No. All right, I think I have the next one. So the agenda was light today, so I was thinking in the back of my head, what else could we use this time for? But now we sort of filled it up, so that worked out well. Um, but I just wanted to either have a discussion or see if there's interest in maybe turning uh, like every, every other one of these meetings into an office hours of sorts. Uh, I don't have any idea how this could work in practice because I just thought of it as, as I was driving back home today. Um, I've seen it work well with other specific projects, um, but maybe like, you know, we could do more of a public announcement of it and if projects are looking for security help or something like we could come together and sort of help. So. I don't know. I haven't, again, I haven't put a lot of thought into this, but thought maybe it'd be a good use of time as we're trying to secure more critical projects. So any, any thoughts, anyone? I like it. I think if we can bake it into our meetings and just have like an open forum, I think that's a great idea just to make it more open and inclusive for anyone. So I support it. Cool. We can talk about what compiler flags to use. <laughs> I have to admit, I'm a little afraid if every open source project starts showing up <laughs> all at once. Uh, but, you know, we, we can try and stop if it turns out to be a problem. <laughs> yeah, I, just, I mean, or just structure it a little differently. Maybe we pick a different topic um, or a different theme for each, each session. And um, so I don't know. I co-organize the Kubernetes office hours, um, and they are every third Wednesday, uh, where people can just come by and ask questions. Hey, how do I use Kubernetes? This is so complex. Please help me figure it out. And uh -huh. we usually start by saying, we don't have access to your cluster. We cannot debug things for you. Um, but you can try to formulate your questions as well as possible. So if you need help with that, I would be happy to help, especially also the streaming setup. Um, Kubernetes streams live to uh, YouTube, for example, and um, shares the Slack. Um, as well, because there's where the questions get asked and so on. So, yeah. How's it working out for you all? So, we roughly average 100 viewers um, on for like one hour. Um, and we get like roughly between 10 and 30 questions asked. And it's like, it's sometimes very overwhelming. We usually have a panel of like five to 10 people that try to answer these questions. We share experiences. Usually we try, currently we're also in the process of trying to roll out SICK um, specific or like working, for you it would be working groups, but um, at Kubernetes it's um, special interest groups um, to have them also have an open um, office hours. So we want to have SICK specific office hours as well. Um, yeah. So like whatever there is in terms of SICK. Yeah, maybe we try something like getting questions in advance or something, and then the audience can sort of tailor itself to who's interested in helping, who's interested in listening. So, yeah, I don't know. If you have ideas, throw them in the doc and the agenda, and I'll think about it some more, too, and just see if you know, there's something there that we can spearhead. Um, and, yes, lots of drama in the news this week on security <laughs> stuff. <laughs> David is one of all you. <laughs> Okay, I, I I just added this to the agenda, so I hope that's okay. Yeah. Are, are you good with that? Okay, so uh, those of you who are not aware, uh, there's this big brouhaha. Um, some University of Minnesota researchers decided to start sending malicious patches to the Linux kernel without any consent by the people being experimented on. Um, it turns out that you're not supposed to be experimenting on people without their consent. Uh, but uh, 
uh, they did it anyway. So um, I don't know. You know so the, 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 the quick answer right now is that uh, the Linux kernel folks have banned University of Minnesota from any contributions and are working through and uh, removing a lot of past contributions uh, under the assumption of bad and less proven otherwise. Um, we, uh, although in theory, we don't know if, that they attacked anybody else. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, this is fundamentally unethical behavior. So uh, we, since they didn't warn the Linux kernel developers, I'm not, sure i should trust anything else they say so that's, um, that's truly the problem is that they, that's right they they wrecked the trust and they ended up retroactively ruining their own reputation to the point that all of many hundreds of what appear to be legitimate and good faith patches uh, are being reverted from the kernel or at least under threat for revert um i i actually spent a great deal of time yesterday attempting to map their uh, commit history against the various research papers that they've produced over the last couple of years and is overwhelmingly in good faith. It's all legit fixes, legit security. Um, and I, th I think with other people's help, we found the, the five attempts they made at, at uh, you know, evil patches, um, which were sort of isolated to one, one paper. Um, and, does not appear to reflect on the rest of it, although there is a question uh, about sort of current research is uh, not malicious per se, but looks to be relatively flawed. So because they wrecked the trust and then they showed up with bad patches that appeared to be unintentionally bad, um, they've now really shot themselves in the foot and um unfortunately that means a ton more work for maintainers to go back and re-review something like 250 patches yeah i do want to make it clear I, i'm not opposed to research i am all yeah. for research hooray please go research but you're not allowed to attack systems without nope. permission of the owners you're not allowed nope. to experiment on humans without permission and consent by the humans mm -hmm. uh these are kind of basic these are kind of basic basics Right. And I'm tipped. <laughs> so. yeah. David, do you know if it went through institutional review at the university? Ah, yes, I know this. They did not go through an IRB before they did the experiment. After they did the experiment, they then went to the IRB who said, okay. So first mm. of all, experimenting on humans on and then doing an IRB is exactly not okay. And um, now I'm, to be clear, I'm not a lawyer. OK, but uh, it seems to me a pretty clear ethical violation and possibly civil, civil and criminal. Um, I don't know that. I'm not a lawyer, yada, yada. But um, I mean, this just is, is crazy stuff. Um, right now, I did, I did a quick search on the CI best practices badge. We don't have any searches from anybody from University of Minnesota. Case, if you have, Case, if you have a better um, uh, set of things to search for, uh, so I can uh, have more targeted searches for potential bad actors because I'm just oh, looking. Contributions. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's just, you know, basically, I mean, you know, so that we can uh, look at uh, the commits most likely to need re-review. Right. Uh, yeah. I think the, the issue is that of regaining trust because I think the bulk of the, the, the vast majority of, of patches were completely in good faith and interested in fixing legitimate bugs, but they wreck their just, own trust. So now we have a re-review everything. As far as, that's okay. As far as I understood, like the, from the research paper of yesterday, they did use randomized emails from Gmail. Like they yeah, didn't use their university them. here. Yeah, right. I, yeah. Just saying that as far as I know, the Slack message just said you look for um, from University of Minnesota, but like yeah. um, the commits, commits that were made previously were like not used using this email domain. Yeah, like a uh, James Bond at Gmail or something, something like, like that. Something like that, yeah. James Bond. And yeah, it's actually not just James George Bond, but Bond. included James Bond in there. So, mm -hmm. <coughs> but basically, uh, yeah, if, uh, you know, improvements on uh, ways to detect. We lost David. And is just, oh. you know, if you, if you do anything, I, mean, I had to go through IRBs to do surveys. 
you know, oh my gosh, what are you, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, trying to insert malicious code into a compiler used by billions of devices uh, is just, it blows my mind why anybody thought that was okay. <laughs> Sounds like they're doing security research on the IRB. Uh, <laughs> Not themselves. <laughs> Yeah, so I, as you can tell, I'm ticked. Um, you know, I, yes, obviously, other people probably have submitted, have, have attempted to submit uh, things in bad faith, but if you're from a researcher, you should know better. Yeah, it, it's funny because what, you know, trying to figure out this is uh, like codes of conduct are mostly designed to protect contributors from other contributors, but there isn't usually any language to protect a project from contributors. Um, so you like this now presents a whole new social thing to add to codes of conduct, which is don't don't add malicious code. Like it does. Why did that need to be said? But yeah, you know, I, I'm actually I'm actually skeptical that that needs to be added. Uh, in in particular, in this yeah. case, uh, it's already not okay to do experiment on humans. I'm sorry, yeah, but, it's still not okay, and they're called it a process. Didn't know that. Like they didn't know that, and yeah, why? I, like that. That's I think the there's I think no, there's nobody at a university doesn't know that. Like if you work at a, if you're a professor at a university, you know that you have to go through IRBs for any human research. Yep. So if you're working, so you know, security researchers, right? If you go look at most bug bounty, you know, policies, they say no social engineering, right, at all, and that's because the security team usually has a pretty well defined, like you know, if you're gonna do you know, pen testing against our firm, like you have to get hired, like we hire an external firm to do that. And they sign a bunch of legal documents saying like, what's okay and what's not okay. And the scope is very well defined. Um, you know, like, you, so you don't end up with the, you know, the case where, well, I mean, there was the case of the courthouse, if you uh, let uh, coal fire and, and courthouse and ending up like with all those guys getting prosecuted, you have to be really, really careful about engagements like that. And so those are not usually open for the public. They're something that is is defined and explicit. Now to say that a, a pen test of the Linux kernel environment, uh, that the Linux Foundation shouldn't potentially hire for that, that should potentially happen right but it should be with some intention and you know at like some buy-in from people that are higher up and like you know it should be then said yes we did this intentionally to test the overall security but it shouldn't be happening like a, by a university like that what well, we the linux foundation are paying for and are wrapping up an evaluate an evaluation of part of the development process of the linux kernel I mean, we're not we are not opposed to security reviews <laughs> It's just they have to be done in a way that involves the consent <laughs> mm -hmm. by those, those being affected. Okay, so anyway, I just thought that would be uh, important. It's in the news. You're going to see it anyway. <laughs> yep. Is the criticality it score under this project? Mm, yes, I think so. Okay. Are we done with the previous topic? Yes. Okay. So I am in the process of making my way through How to Measure Anything in Cybersecurity Risk, which is a really interesting book. Um, I'm, and I haven't done a ton of look at, at like the OSS criticality score, but doing, I have done some, I like downloaded the thing and looked at it um, and it matches like your intuition, but I'm wondering if there's been any exploration of like checking the OSS criticality score against uh like you know common ways that companies have actually been breached right like you know what is what are common attack vectors that have actually been for you know ways that like comparing oss criticality score with like is this actually measuring something that is accurate or is it totally disproportionate to what you know actually causes breaches or causes data loss or causes you know i mean struts is clearly right like a big one because it's caused a lot of pain a lot of suffering you know a lot of, a lot of data loss not pain and suffering but data loss um and and um you know it, it's great to say well this you know this project looks important right versus like let's look at the historical data of like and because we have plenty like every single breach that has occurred right that has had any significance has been publicly disclosed um, and for a lot of them, there's a, there's a, a like, this is, you know, the, the root cause, um, doing that kind of comparison, um, also, you know, in general, the people, you know, people that are directly involved in that book, um, how to, how to measure anything in, in uh, cybersecurity risk. I'm not finished with the book, but it puts a very compelling case on 
why metrics and ma and, and numbers like this should have like scientific basis to back them up around like you know this act this these numbers like have been proven to within 90 percent you know like w within like a 50 percent or like some some percentage point um range like have a have a have a 50 percent chance or like a 10 percent chance or whatever like of, of actually accurately representing the risks in your supply chain like you know giving some numerical values of like you know probabilistic like how how accurate are these numbers how you know what are the p values on these numbers stuff like that um so um yeah do you think those authors want to come and give a presentation we should we should reach out for the book you want to link the book, Jonathan? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, well, it's in the channel. I linked it uh, yet a couple days ago. Oh, okay. I can link it again um, in here. Oh, I can link it in the in the um, meeting mm -hmm. notes. I just added a link that we started and didn't really go anywhere with, which is um, sort of similar idea, but thinking about like what would make a critical project like a security critical project, like if they were you know attacked, how bad would it be? Um, yeah. So maybe they're not that popular, but they're actually, you know, not maintained by anyone. But if they were breached, they would have massive implications. So I don't know if there's stuff in there. I, I haven't looked at that doc recently, but just ideas and stuff to throw throw in there. I think most of the Googlers drop that work on that project. But um, yeah, I mean, certainly open to you know things that improve the the criticality criticality score project. Um, I think one thing we've sort of you know, I've been learning, like, we're never going to get the list right. And I think there's an obvious top list of projects we can almost start with. It. Um, Amir's on the call and came up with a list of, you know, critical projects that need some help. And we're looking at trying to fund um, some re remediation there. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this is interesting. I think at, at some point we do need to come up with a list that people can vaguely agree on. Um, yeah. Maybe, the maybe yeah, the authors contend that, uh, that, um, Although you can't get anything exact, you can get you can get like pretty much everything into a probabilistic state where you have a probability of it being and like a, a a and so using there's a I'm I'm my math, like math and statistics are are not incredibly strong, but basically they they use like Bayes theorem and a bunch of other like you know Monte Carlo simulations to to determine like you know if you do a bunch of simulations based upon this, where is the impact going to be? Um, and uh, it, it, you know, you can get the estimations of like cost and things like that into a really well-defined um, uh, predictive model that, that you know, um, uh, can be leveraged. And so that would, I think, make this number, this, this, this metric um, more useful at, for, for people trying to incorporate that information into their cybersecurity model. Um, I don't know. The book is incredibly dense. Incredibly dense. I'm listening to it as an audiobook. Um uh uh and I'm, you know, but I I, st I still recommend it for people that are in trying to do this sort of thing. So, yeah. I I've read the book I as an audiobook. I don't even know how you could possibly follow it. It's got all these charts and stuff. Um so it, it is interesting and you he's and Jonathan's right about the Monte Carlo. Uh basically, I mean, one of the key things that they did, which I did think was interesting was you know, list all the things that you think are atta are attacks. List the the probabilities. List the range of damage, and then doing Monte Carlo simulations. And instead of getting a single number, getting a graph of what are the probabilities of different damages measured in dollars. Uh, it certainly was an interesting approach. I I I'm not sure how that could be applied to open source, but m maybe I'm just not being creative enough about applying their ideas. So it, it is interesting, that's for sure. Um, when I work with the government, with the U.S. government, the, the struggle we had was it was interesting, but a lot of their damages are hard to calculate as dollars. So that was a cool, I don't know how I apply this, but, um, and I think the same is true right now for me thinking about this for open source. But sure, bring them on, and if they can... If we could connect the dots together, that might be really interesting. Yeah. If you could compute it as dollars, then you could say, hey, like, you know, if you want to offset this much risk for these open source projects, right? Like, we need this investment, right? Like, you, right. Could, you, you, you that that's a good selling point, right? It is not like, you know, because it is open source, right? Like, there's a bunch of open source projects using it. But like, you know, there are businesses that are using open source and you could sell it to them as like, this is the amount of co financial risk you are introducing potentially, whatever. Yeah. Right. And this is if you spent these many dollars, this is what your reduced risk would be. 
Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I don't know how accessible the authors are, but I think it'd be great if they want to come <laughs> give us a TLDR of their book and we can think creatively how to apply it. Or, or, or ask them straight, you know, oh, we're doing this. We like your book. Well, we, we're interested in your book, but we can't see how to apply it. <laughs> We'd love to hear it from you. <laughs> let, let them do the hard part. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, and then I just added a link to a paper someone plugged in in the chat, which looks related to this. All right, I think that's a wrap. So good seeing everyone. Um, feel free to add agenda items for next time. I think a couple of us have some homework, so. All right, oh, one more link. More. I'll add that one to the notes too. Before I use it. Cool. All right. Have a good day, everyone. Thanks, Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Case. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Cheers.